Um, but we're going to begin today in chapter 12, uh, just starting wherever, however, we, we've always started, though, with any questions about the first uh, 11 chapters uh, from where we left off last time, anything that percolated up over the last two weeks that you would like to revisit briefly before we jump into the next two chapters. Yeah, Bruce. I thought it was kind of funny. That it, 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 chapter 11, the first, first bit there, she says, they're talking about Lazarus and things. Mm -hmm. And at verse 2, it says, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his, his feet with her hair. And I thought, oh, good. I'm going to look because it said earlier, you know, you, you knew, you already knew about this because it said it, it said it earlier. So I thought, well, I'll look in the other gospels. Of course, it's not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's, it's actually in first into verse twelve. Yeah. <laughs> so how did how can it, it doesn't go chronological as you pointed out more than once. Right. So the the right. Well, uh, this is actually a really great uh, segue, Bruce. So a really great segue is the chronology in John is different from the chronology in the Synoptic Gospels. Not only does Jesus go back and forth in between Jerusalem and, and Galilee multiple times, and whereas the Synoptics, he goes to Jerusalem once as far as the Synoptics are concerned, but even the day that the Passover begins is different in John than what it is in the Synoptics. In John, Passover begins on Friday. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Passover begins on uh, Thursday, that's important for the synoptics because everything has to be wrapped up by Shabbat, by, you know, um, um, by Friday. That's, you know, that's really important. John, I don't know if you've noticed this about John, not as, you know, reverent about like some of the Jewish traditions. Uh, and so it doesn't matter that, uh, that things happen uh, on to Friday because according to Jewish tradition, things would have to be all wrapped up, right? There, you know, the, in terms of, you know, the Sabbath, you know, the Sabbath day. Uh, so, um, so yeah, the other thing you get here is a very brief short, like, foreshadowing, right? It's, it's foreshadowed in 11 and it happens in 12, right? You know, yeah. Like, so it, it doesn't take too long. Um, and in, in, in movie versions of this, uh, like uh, The Greatest Story Ever Told or The Last Temptation of Christ or any of those uh, cinematic adaptations of Jesus's life, um, the, Mary in, the Mary who washes, or Jesus Christ Superstar, right? Or any of those, the, the Mary who washes, anoints Jesus's feet is Mary Magdalene you know um which you know is very interesting as well so um there's all those things happening so i appreciate you bringing that up bruce uh any other comments or thoughts before we move forward okay so chapter 12 um is often called the, the prelude to the passion because it is in john's gospel there's all sorts of little hints about what starting in chapter 13 all the way through the end to the end of chapter 19 uh, happens in the gospel in the passion narrative of John so in this one little uh, gospel in this one little chapter in uh in the gospel of John you kind of get a foreshadowing Bruce of all of what we will experience in uh in, in the in, in the rest of the the gospel and the passion so uh, so this this brief little bit of chapter twelve verses one through eleven, you get the sense you get this idea that it's six days before the Passover begins. So um, so in these six days, a lot of things kind of take place. Again, they're in Bethany, uh, which will be important to give you a sense of uh, the Palm Sunday or um, the, the the Palm the Palm event. The Palm Parade, if you will, um, and when Jesus and the disciples enter Jerusalem, they're entering from the east. And uh, the east, we just know from archaeological digs that the east gate is a smaller, um, less traveled gate than the gates that are from the north or from the west. Um, we got a sign there. I do have a sign. It says you have to be closer to the mic. Oh, that comes and goes all the time. Yeah, that, but y'all are hearing me okay, right, Carol? Yes. Okay, all right. 
I appreciate you showing me though. That's really kind. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so the so the east gate is uh, a smaller, less uh, traveled gate. It's not as the it's not the 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 big prominent gate uh, of Jerusalem. So um, so it, so this would be like a smaller parade. There wouldn't have been as many people in, involved as say like from if you were coming in from the north or from the west, you could have been this massive, you know, sort of thing. Because I, again, I think we have this picture of maybe like all of Jerusalem kind of came out for this thing where it might not have been, you know, as, as big as that. Um, but we do have this event of 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 Jesus's feet being uh, being anointed uh, by Martha slash Mary, depending on um, uh, depending on <laughs> the, some of the things that we talked about last week with this new uh, this new um, evidence of of potential uh, changing of of the name Mary uh, in in this in this story. And if that's and and one thing to keep in mind is the literal translation of the word the jewish word messiah the hebrew word messiah is the anointed that literally is what a messiah that's what that word means small m messiah is anointed so all the kings of israel were messiahs they were anointed for that matter, many of the prophets at one point were anointed. Samuel himself, who anointed Saul and David, was at one point anointed. And so small m Messiah, that just translates into the anointed. And so by Mary or Martha in the story, uh, anointing Jesus' feet with oil, she's actually doing uh, a rite of sort of, an, of making him a, a, a her in, in in many ways a small M Messiah at that moment because he's being anointed by her. Um, so we have this foreshadowing of him being being the Messiah by her doing something to sort of indicate that he has been uh, anointed and therefore become a small M um, uh, Messiah. We have um, we have the the great crowds that have started to follow him uh, because uh, in chapter um, 12, verse 9, when a great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came only not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus because, like, he's a carnival act now, you know, right? I mean, something like that's, I mean, that's bearded lady stuff. I mean, that's, like, that's pretty amazing. So, um, so you know, he's, there's this kind of carnival aspect of to, to Lazarus. And so lots of people are coming to kind of see what, what has happened. The word has gotten out. And, and so they're not only coming to see Jesus, but they're coming to see with this great sign that of, 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 of this person who's been raised from the dead. So we have this resurrection event and the witnessing of the resurrection event, which of course is a foreshadow to what happens uh, at the end of the gospel as well. Um, but I don't want to jump over. Oh, we also get a foreshadowing of, Jesus, of Judas's betrayal, which I want to talk about Judas in just a little bit more in chapter 13. But if you're thinking about Judas, we're going to talk a little bit about him. Um, but of course, we get this. Um, I don't know. It's been one of those scripture verses that's always troubled me a little bit. The, the whole thing about, you know. Judas saying, hey, you could have sold that for, like, given that money to the poor. And Jesus says, ah, the poor, you already, you always have the poor with you, but I'm only with you for about. <laughs> oh, like, I want Jesus, I don't want Jesus to say that. <laughs> my Jesus would say, you know, you can put a little bit on my feet, but, like, let's sell the rest of it. <laughs> that felt good, but, like, we should really give the rest of that away. Uh, that's what I want my Jesus to say, but that's not what he says. Well, he doesn't say just that, though. She has plenty of it to yeah. get his first various. Right. Right. What he said. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is that first foreshadowing. Yeah, right. It, it's the yeah. foreshadowing of it. Yeah. Right. And uh, do not overlook the fact that she bought that with her own money. Like uh, chapter uh, 12, verse 7. Leave her alone. She bought it. Like, so, like, this doesn't belong to the disciples. Like I think a lot of times we think like, oh, the, she took she took something that the disciples had bought, 
Like this is hers, like you know, property rights here. Like she can do with whatever she wants, you know, kind of thing. Um, but this other thing is, and, and just to give you a sense of how much 300 denarii is, you might have a footnote somewhere in your Bible, but if you don't, just to let you know, that's about three, that's almost a whole year's wages. Like that is not a small purchase on her part. So um, 300 denarii, it's, it's, it's a, a good deal of money. Um, so Judas's response there is somewhat, you know, um, disingenuous in terms of like him saying like, you know, telling her what to do with her own stuff and, 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 and the fact that kind of disempowering her with the fact that she is the one who bought it with her, with, like I said, with her own money. Um, but I, but I did just my own personal confession. I always want Jesus to respond differently. Um, that being said, because I've always been very uncomfortable with Jesus's response on, uh, on my own. I did look up a commentary and I did like this. Uh, I can't remember. It was, it was from a commentary called a uh, working preacher, which is out of Luther seminary. And the, and the, the commentator wrote, uh, Jesus's response, uh, says that, uh, Mary's, um, uh, spontaneous act of love does not prevent us from continuing to serve the poor on our own. I thought that was a nice little way for me to like. <laughs> God, it sounds like I do. <laughs> but, uh, but I liked it. I liked it. So, uh, so anyway, so that's that, that kind of gives us, if you think of chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, as this kind of mini prelude or foreshadowing to the passion. Uh, you can kind of see the clues of what is about to, to take place. Uh, and John is kind of using this as a transition from Jesus's public ministry to by the end of chapter 12, uh, you get the end of Jesus's public ministry. Does anyone have a, a note in their Bible at verse 12? Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 20, that says the end of Jesus's public ministry. Some Bibles actually kind of denote that this in the Gospel of John is Jesus will never sort of do things outside of Jerusalem again, and his his teachings and everything are, are geared more towards the disciples. Uh, it's not more. It's not so much geared towards the crowds or towards the the people. Yeah, yeah. So the, some Bibles do, some Bibles don't, but. Start, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Some some have kind of demarcated it. Some have demarcated it. Um, but then we get the the palm parade starting um, in verse um, verse verse twelve, and it's the it's the first day the uh, it's the first day of the festival of the Passover. So. I, I think most of us, many of us around the table and online have, have been in church on Palm Sunday. You've probably heard that um, Jerusalem would have tripled in size in, um, over the, the Passover festival. And then many uh, uh, festival goers would have stuck around uh, all the way through to Pente Pentecost or the, uh, the festival of the harvest after the festival of booths. Uh, after uh, that six weeks later, because the, the the walk home to come back was just too much. So they would stay. So Jerusalem is like bursting at the seams at this point. And, um, and Jesus is, and with that would have come a increase in Roman um, peacekeepers, if you will, uh, to kind of, kind of keep the peace in Jerusalem during this time. Because there was a history of Jewish revolt and little acts of uh, a rebellion um, during this time, since you were celebrating the, the the Passover, the liberation from the tyranny of Egypt. Here they are living under the tyranny of of Rome, and it was kind of a natural time to uh, for zealots and certain segments of the population to 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 resist, to rebel, to just cause you know, some headaches for the, the Roman Empire. And so that's why you would have Greeks, if you go to chapter 20. Now, among those who were worshiping at the festival were some Greeks. There is, there's, 
debate over who those Greeks are. Are those Greek speaking Jews who came to the festival to, um, to, to celebrate the Passover or are those Gentiles who were what were called God fearers? So um, there was a first century term for non-Jews who worship the Jewish God. They were called God fearers. And they would often kind of mill about the synagogues and, um, and, and, and participate in the festivals as sort of visitors and such. Not, not, they would not be allowed in the temple grounds. They wouldn't be allowed in, in, in any sort of sacred space. But you got to remember, like, there are no, these are all open air buildings, right? There's no glass. There's no, there, you know, so you can hear what's going on. It's like, it's like, it, it's like experiencing the ushers, experiencing worship from the narthex with the doors open. You know, like you're 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 experiencing worship, but you're not in worship at that point, right? You know, kind of, uh, so um, so that's kind of what the God fears were. So there's debate whether the Greeks that uh, that are there are Greek speaking Jews or if they're Gentiles. I lean kind of towards their Gentiles, uh, that they're God fears, and that this section in chapter twenty is another foreshadowing of the Gentile mission. Right, that after the, the, the resurrection and the beginning of the, the Christian church, that the um that the, the church will very quickly kind of pivot away from the Jewish mission to the Gentile mission, and that this is kind of John's way of including a story to kind of foreshadow um foreshadow that. Um but then in chapter seven, uh, chapter 12, verse 27 we get John's version of the Garden of Gethsemane, though it's not really the Garden of Gethsemane. He's not in that garden, that, that typical garden, but a lot of the same lines that Jesus speaks in this portion of chapter 12 are reminiscent of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We have the, my soul is very troubled, um, and not the we don't get the 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 famous let this cup pass from me but we do get the father save me from this hour you know those those are those are the uh, the, the 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 midnight of the soul kind of stuff that Jesus is going through the in in uh, the garden of gethsemane but unlike the garden of gethsemane when Jesus asks in the synoptic gospels Matthew Mark and Luke and Jesus says, my God, you know, Father, take this, you know, if it be your will, let this cup pass for me, and that kind of thing. And does God say anything to Jesus? No, there's like, right, that God is silent in the Garden of Gethsemane. God allows Jesus to kind of wrestle with what's going on, and, 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 and Jesus has to kind of interpret the silence for himself. God is not silent in John's version. Jesus gets an answer right away. And I don't know about you, but I like the Garden of Gethsemane version better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, for me, it kind of, so we got two different things going on, right? Do you like your Jesus like really human? Or do you like your Jesus really divine? <laughs> because what you have here in the Garden of Gethsemane version, the synoptics, is a very human Jesus who's scared out of his wits, out of something that is about horrific that is about to happen to him. And you can just sort of sense his mind just wrestling with that and the and then the courage to say yes i know this horrible thing's about to happen but i'm going to go through go you know go go through it and go through it anyway and then but then on the other side you have this jesus that has like this such special relationship with god that he was god and in the beginning was with god that kind of thing that god kind of alleviates him of any sort of worry that you know it's all going to be all right um, and so this is really important, my friends, because this chapter and this, uh, these verses in chapter 12 is um, what 
um, was given as biblical evidence by in the very first, well, not that's not true. I guess the, the Gentile question was the first controversy of the church. One of the first great theological debates of the early Christian church was this guy idea about uh, was Jesus human or was, was Jesus truly human or was Jesus just God in, in human clothing? You know, kind of thing, and that that controversy was has the worst name. It was called Arianism, but not. Don't think of Arianism like you know, like white supremacy Arianism. Uh, but it was called Arianism, and in Arianism, Arian uh, the Arianists claimed that Jesus was not really human, and that he really was just an avatar for God for Yahweh and that Jesus did not go through this world like we go through this world with all our angst and worries and unknowns um that Jesus was truly just a divine being covered in human flesh and the church rejected that and said no Jesus went go Jesus was as human as you and I are human and and even though that Jesus had glimpses of of sort of divinity, if you will, that particularly in the Passion, when Jesus felt abandoned by God, that's a true feeling of abandonment by God. When Jesus cries out, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Jesus feels truly abandoned and separated from God in that moment. I raise that to you because this controversy. Um, this, what the church called a, a heresy continues to raise its head through the centuries of Christianity. The pendulum will swing every so often to, you know, this this like, oh no, he's 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 really just God. We all, we only get the God side, um, and um, and then the pendulum will swing back the other way, and we'll kind of get a humanistic kind of God, our Jesus, and then it just kind of swings back and forth. Um, but when that art, when that uh, controversy was being argued in the early church, this chapter, and particularly these verses in uh, chapter 12, from 27 to 35, when God is like responding to Jesus, is what was given as proof by the Arianists that Jesus was not human, not like you and I are, that he was just like the Greek God, like an avatar, was really like like Zeus in like human clothing kind of thing. So I just wanted, I always like to point those things out to you when we when we get there. I, I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Here, really offer an opinion. I don't know. But the, the way I was reading this from 23 on, it, it is very different than the garden because it, where in all the previous chapters, he said the hour hasn't come yet. Wait, wait, just a minute. You know, hour hasn't come now. The hours come, but he poses that question: What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I'm here now, mm -hmm. and that that had a whole different kind of feel to me. That was saying, Chris, <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm here for you, mm -hmm. and so. Um, the dichotomy between Gethsemane and here and the same thing is huge. Yeah, did you feel kind of drawn to one or the other? No, because okay. I feel the angst in Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that power of God coming through saying, this is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. This is, that was a huge big thing for mm -hmm. me that it was yeah. so different. So. Yeah, they're pretty stark. Yeah, yeah, big time. This almost has almost a bab baptiz baptism feel to it, where you know the, the sky's open and you know this is my this is my son, my beloved, you know, with whom I'm well pleased. There it has almost that kind of feel to it, doesn't it? Yeah, and yeah. Then, I think it was in 28 when God's talking, He says it. I'm going to glorify it now, but I'm going to glorify it again. I had to stop with that one. Okay, mm -hmm. what's again mean? And then, so then, you know, when you look at the Daryl, yeah, one second, Dick, are you are you ready, Chris? Yeah, it, I didn't it was just well. the understanding that was bringing us to the resurrection. That yeah, it's again part of that portion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took that minute, sure, that sure. Okay. Really, to, to try to 
Might it not be really important this thing that the Greeks appear? The reason I suggest it is that um, Messiah only had meaning to Jews. And thus far in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus has only been presented to Jews. Mm -hmm. The arguments have only been presented to Jews. Now, the Greeks appear. They don't just appear. They ask to see him. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, again, the drama here, I think it's written so that the two disciples that come and say, hey, these Greeks want to see you, they're presenting this as a problem. The problem now becomes Rome's problem even more than it was just the Messiah of the Jews, because now there's some non-Jews that want to follow him. That's I, I oh no, I think that's brilliant. I yeah. think there was something in there about that. Yeah, because, I mean, I don't think John does anything by accident. I think he's, I think he's careless. <laughs> right. <laughs> Seriously, by accident, and yeah. boom. Right. And that's and that's when he says, My hour has now come. It's when the when the Greeks appear. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's good, Dick. I appreciate that. That's really that's, good. No, that, that's great insight. Any other yeah. wonderful insight? Sure. Yeah, can I say something yeah. to the the car? Um in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is just talking to God himself. But in verse 29, when when God talked to Jesus, it says the crowd standing by heard it and said that it had thundered. So I'm, I'm thinking this is more of a public, I don't know if the, the crowd had any idea what the thunder was, or the thunder just came out of a clear sky, or that kind of wondered significance of that. Yeah, well, I think that's, um, that's, I think that's a typical of uh, theophanies, Dave. So um, uh, appearances of God in, in, in Hebrew scripture, as well as in other writings that aren't even in the Bible, that uh, there are instances when people, when the when the prophet or or the king or whatever who or Moses who's communicating directly with God hear God's hear hears God's voice very clearly, but those who are in proximity often hear it as something else, right? And, and often that is a, a thunder. So I think that's a I think that's a typical trope in. Um, Judeo-Christian theophany stories that God, you might hear God clearly, but the rest of us would just hear it as something else. Does that make sense? But it didn't really mean anything to the crowd because the, then it goes on to say um, others said an angel has spoken to him. Right. So I think you have those who, in the story, you kind of get the sense in the narrative, like Jesus hears it clearly. Others are kind of confused by it. Others can kind of sense it, but maybe it's something different. Maybe they sense that Jesus is hearing it, but they can't hear it themselves. You know, they're trying, everybody's just trying to figure out what's going on. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. It just, again, seems so opposite of, the Garden of Gethsemane that was more just a private. It's a private thing, right? Yeah, right. And and there's nothing. There's also no transfiguration in the Gospel of John, and this has somewhat of a transfiguration kind of vision to it, story to it. You don't see Jesus becoming dazzling white, but he does talk about glory. Um, and again, God's God's voice is is, is being heard. And I could be wrong. I have to look up the other transfiguration stories, but I can't remember if the disciples understand what God says or not. No, they do they hear it? They don't hear it. Oh, they—they. They, this is my son. Oh, they do. Okay. Listen to it, right? And then, then he walks away and he says, "Oh, they get disappointed." That was that was the thing you left me with when you <laughs> <laughs> right when you covered for me. I yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, Daryl, yeah. Just what's the the other thing? 
uh, about this that, that sort of hits me is what you just he's, he uses the words I'm going to be lifted up mm -hmm. and you know you think transfiguration but that's not at all what he means lifted up on a cross mm -hmm. correct is what John is trying to right talk about again yeah which is why this chapter is often called the prelude to the passion right yeah but, it's but all John, John is suggesting I think that this glorified is the crucifixion mm -hmm. not the transfiguration agreed. agreed which i think was one reason why you don't get the transfiguration in john uh lastly before we move on to chapter um uh, uh 13 i want you to look at chapter 12 verse 41 which might seem like the most innocuous non-important verse in the entire chapter Isaiah said this because he saw his glory, because he, Isaiah, saw his, Jesus' glory and spoke about him. That verse right there, in a nutshell, <laughs> is what the early Christian church did with the Hebrew Bible. So, so, so if you think about these, uh, the early disciples, so many of the early church leaders, they were, they were Jews. And they grew up reading Torah, they grew up hearing about the prophets, and they grew up with those books, those teachings, those psalms, meaning something completely different. Then after uh, encountering Jesus, whether that be in, uh, in real time, like the early disciples and apostles, or those who came after them, the, the early church patriarchs and such, they went back and scoured those Hebrew texts looking for proof that Jesus was this Messiah and looking for, really looking for an answer to the question, why did Jesus have to die? When the Messiah was never meant to die, and yet here they are claiming that this was the Messiah, they went back to the Hebrew text to find evidence as to maybe there was something we missed. Maybe we were misinterpreting this all along. And so they go back. So they are early church leaders, patriarchs and such. They go back and they start scouring through the Bible. And two books in particular get lifted up above all the other scriptures in the Hebrew Bible as evidence for this messianic prophecy of Jesus. And that is the prophecy of Isaiah and the book of Psalms. They find more, they find more evidence of, of, of Jesus, of a foreshadowing and a prophecy of Jesus being the Messiah. Now, of course, does Isaiah ever mention the word, the name Jesus, or in that case, Hebrew would be Joshua? No, no. But but church leaders, church uh, early church um, founders, they look back on that scripture, and particularly though John's not doing it, particularly the suffering servant texts in Isaiah became incredibly important mm -hmm. as well. And John here almost directly quotes Isaiah's, you know, uh, I think it's chapter nine, which we read on Christmas Eve. You know, there are the people who walked in darkness and have seen a great light. You know, Jesus almost quotes Isaiah here almost directly. So that verse 41, you might have read over that and gone like, all right, fine. But that was a really important exercise for the early church. How is it that we know that Jesus is the Messiah? <laughs> read, read the prophecy of Isaiah, read the book of Psalms, and you can't, and according to the early church, you can't help but find Jesus in those in that prophecy and in those and in those songs. Um, and so that's those are those were really important. So you find Isaiah being and the Psalms being quoted in the Gospels more than any other Hebrew text. And you never hear Jesus like quote like the book of Joshua, or the, I mean his name is Joshua, and he never quotes his own namesake. You know, you know, or you never hear him like quote like the book of you know, Ezra and Nehemiah, like he doesn't quote those. He like he always he always goes back to you have a great look on your face. I do. I see it as a script that he followed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was written and therefore I shall follow this path. Sure. 
Yeah, yeah, and, but those in real time didn't get that. And so it was after the fact that they went back and, and scoured those books. So that's why you find so many of these these quotes. As, as it's written, yeah. Yeah, and so think about it. I mean, think about it as, you know, I, I always had I always had to like you know sort, cite my sources in my in my term papers in college and seminary. That's basically what John's doing here. He's citing his sources, right? Okay, excellent. Let's move on to chapter thirteen. Uh, a much shorter uh, chapter, but no less profound. So it's right here that I kind of want to give Judas a little bit of time. How many of y'all feel bad for Judas? What makes you feel bad for him? Because he didn't have a choice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is not fair. Yeah, right? Right? Yeah. Well, I was wondering when I was reading this and you were talking about all the forces, and, and, and I, I got the, the feeling or the sense that Jesus picked him specifically to be the fall guy. Mm hmm. And, and I chose kind of says that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, is the, he didn't, like you, he, I, he didn't really have, he, Judas, didn't yeah. really have a whole lot of choice. He was kind of, what, for, for, or the, for ordained? Yeah. <laughs> and this. Yeah, how Calvinistic of you. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I knew what I was saying that too. I knew what I was saying. Anyone else feel bad for Judas? Or yeah, was it, yeah. I do. Um, I don't think he had a choice at all. And it was like saying to your kids, okay, you've done this. Maybe they're innocent, but you declare you've done this. Yeah. So you might as well do it. You've been accused. Judas was this individual who not a great guy to begin with, but he was still, Jesus still welcomed him in knowing that he had to play a part. Mm -hmm. Whether or not he was chosen to play the part it would be a great discussion. Mm -hmm. So I just try to take a look well, at yeah. the before and after. Well, uh, Judas has been a controversial figure in uh, Christianity from the beginning. Um, and there has been uh, many um, treatises and and sermons and um, and everything are, are written about Judas, where Judas turns into a really bad dude, and all of us live on this side of him being turned into a really bad dude is Dante. Dante's Inferno. Judas is is one of the three heads of Satan in, uh, in, in Dante's, uh, I can't remember what level of hell, it might have actually have been the ninth. Um, no joke, I have not read all of the, I've only read the very small cliff notey version of, of Dante's <laughs> Inferno. I've not read all of Dante's Inferno. Um, but of course, with the, the Brutus and Cassius uh, and Judas, the three heads of the, of the betrayers, uh, is is the face of Satan in Dante's, and so um, there is a pre Dante and post Dante uh, opinion about Judas. Wasn't there a book that came out that was discovered? And Not was... a book. Use the right word. It was a gospel. Oh. <laughs> uh, Save that word for. Yeah. <laughs> it was a gospel of Judas. Written well after the four gospels in uh, that are in our New Testament, given around the uh, a third century, so the the two hundreds uh, uh, time is when they they think that it was written, uh, and it was found as you can imagine, it was found heretical uh, by the early church. Two reasons why it was found heretical: one is it presents Judas as Jesus's brother. So uh, Ju uh, Judas, the twin, who who is his twin? His twin is his twin is Jesus. So you have you have brother on brother crime going on uh, in the Gospel of Judas. The other thing that the I did read the Gospel of Judas though. That was, uh, <laughs> um, and the uh, the second thing that uh, the reason why it was found heretical 
was because, as some of you have mentioned, uh, that he was preordained to do the act of betrayal because without the betrayal, the passion cannot happen and therefore God cannot be glorified without the betrayal. And so Judas's um, actions were not his own. And then they, so then Chris, you say, well, but it says like the devil that is betrayed in the gospel of Judas, at least as early church propaganda to dis, to dis, what's the word I'm looking for? Disparage the name of Judas. Uh, uh, and so uh, that the, that it wasn't the devil who entered Judas's heart. It really was God who told Judas to do these things. So all of those things combined, that he was Jesus's bro biological brother, and that it was actually God who preordained the betrayal, the church was like, no, there's no way that's getting in the New Testament. There's no way. <laughs> and so, but I do want you to know that that's out there. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating read. It, it's very short. Um, and uh, it presents a very different version of Judas. Still to this day, my favorite version of Judas is from Jesus Christ Superstar. I love it. He's the best. And it's probably singing that part. I, it's a, did you hear me sing on Sunday in the announcement song, Dick? That's, no one wants to hear me sing. No, you were singing. No. So, so the one thing that the one thing I will say on chapter uh, 13, verse 27, I do want you to notice that Jesus does not deny Judas like the bread. So when you think about who's at the table, no, granted, John, John does not present this as a, Paso uh, a Passover meal and like the way the synoptics do. This is not a Eucharistic meal. We don't get the, this is my body broken for you. This is not, this is not, this is my blood poured out for you. We don't get that Eucharistic language in John, but we still get this very kind of ceremonial meal. Notice that Jesus cleans the feet of Judas. Notice that Jesus breaks bread with Judas. Um, Judas is not denied anything uh, in terms of what the other disciples get. So around the table, you have a doubter, you have a denier, you have a betrayer, and Jesus treats them all equally. Um, and so that's there's a good word in that for us, that uh, none of us come to the table like completely pure. Um, and so... But Jesus in chapter 20, uh, he actually turns to him at some point, at one point, and says, do quickly what you are going to do. So you do get this sense of Jesus is giving it his, in, his endorsement. Um, and um, I don't know, it's, it's I, find, I find that to almost be a compassionate word, like, so I, I find it the way where he's and maybe I've watched too many Jesus movies, but like you know, the kind of put his hand on it, put his hand on his shoulder, like go and do it, go do it quickly. You know, if you do it quickly, it won't hurt as bad. Like it's you know, it's kind of like the band-aid. Um, but of course, we get these other things that are very important to the gospel. Um, you get the very famous foot washing, um, which I always like to mention on Monday, Thursday, which is the commemoration of this event, that um, whenever we do a, a ceremonial hand washing or foot washing or such, um, that the stole that uh, Reverend Sherlock and I uh, wear is a symbol of the towel that Jesus uses in the foot washing. That's what our stoles represent. It's, both, it's a symbol of our servant leadership. Um, which I know Dick would join me in saying, I wish more of my colleagues kept in mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't wear them. Uh, so uh, it's supposed to be to remind us of our humility uh, and that we are called to serve. Um, but uh, again, I'll leave my, I'll use, leave my editorial at that. Um, but what is a foot washing? So again, it's if you look in the first century, if you look at uh, Jewish practices, a foot washing is not um, it's not a bath. <laughs> it is a, a ritual of purification. 
And so, um, so in many ways, uh, Jesus, whereas in the synoptics, you get the ritual of, of the Last Supper. Here, you get the ritual of, of purification through serve, the service of others. Um, and, and if you think about the first century wearing sandals, how, often, how much these people walked, you know, that is not... Uh, um, that is not a glamorous like act, right? It really is an act of, and um, I don't know, way back, you know, he's been Pope for a while now, but one of the very first things that Pope Francis did to kind of separate him from Pope Benedict was one of the very first things he did was go to uh, a prison and wash the feet of the prison, the, the incarcerated as an act of, of humility and his, I mean, you knew his papacy was going to be very different from Benedict, like right then. Um, so, um, so yeah, so just that's what the, that foot washing is. It's an act of humility. Um, it's an act of servant uh, service, and it's an act of purification. Um, so then, I don't know what else I want to say about this. Um, the other thing, obviously, you get um, the very important. Uh, idea of the, the the new commandment. So if you uh, jump ahead to verse thirty three, little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I say, where I am going, you cannot come. And I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, and you should love. Uh, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Um, and so that, the, the giving of the new commandment is actually where we get the name for Monday Thursday. Mandatum is Latin for commandment. And so that's why Monday Thursday is called Monday Thursday. It's the giving of the new commandment, the mandatum. New, 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 new mandatum. My Latin is not the best. Um, but in the earlier chapters, just before this, one second, uh, just the chapter one right before this, Jesus says, where do you go? Oh, at the end of chapter 12. Um, For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me gave me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I speak, therefore I speak just as the Father has spoken. So, Bruce, again, that foreshadowing, I, 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 have this new, I have this commandment that has been given to me, Then he gives the commandment in chapter 13, the commandment is love. I think there's some nice symmetry there between, you know, eternal life and love. There's something there for me. Um, and um, because this is, this is the, the only commandment that Jesus gives in the entire in the entire gospel. So um, we can we can draw a direct line from the, the commandment that gives that gives eternal life is the commandment that he gives to the disciples uh, at the end of this this meal where this ritual of purification and and service. So for many folks, um, chapter 13 is a favorite of, of the gospel of John for these reasons. And then lastly, but certainly not least, good old Peter. Peter. <laughs> Sorry about that. I lost my place. I had a little, had a little brain freeze. Uh, Peter. So Peter, one of the ways to think about the purpose of John's gospel was to set the record straight or at least add a corrective to... Um, Peter's place in early Christian uh, hierarchy, and uh, one of the one of the sort of the overall reasons for the gospel was to add a different a different take on things. Um, and one of the one of the, the themes of the Gospel of John for many people is. Uh, that Peter does not come off well, um, and that John 
the writer of the Gospel of John or the community that the Gospel of John comes out of um, did not hold Peter in as high a regard as maybe other communities in the early Christianity. And starting from here on, Peter just loses <laughs> again and again and again. And I just want to run these down for you right now so that as you read through the rest of the gospel, all the way to the end of chapter 20, and then uh, so that you can kind of see um, how much uh, Peter takes it on the chin here. And then when you read chapter 21, um, you can make your own educated guess as to if maybe a pro Peter uh, member uh, maybe added that slightly later. <laughs> but uh, um, but the, the, let me run this down for you. Uh, so starting in chapter uh, 11, Peter does not get to make the messianic affirmation um, like he does in the synoptic gospels. Uh, who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, right? He's the one who actually gets to say that out loud for the very first time. Uh, it's in Peter in John's gospel. Peter isn't the one who gets to make the messianic affirmation. It's Mary slash Martha, depending on um, who you think that character is. Um, Peter does not understand the the the, the foot washing behind it. Uh, Peter chastises Jesus um, in 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 the in the foot washing. His denial is foretold. Uh, Jesus ends the gospel of the chapter eleven. Or, I'm sorry, the chapter uh, tw thirteen with uh, Peter being told that he will not uh, that he will deny Jesus, and he is told that he cannot follow. Um, here in a little bit. Uh, you'll find out that Peter does not get to see the trial of Jesus firsthand, uh, whereas the beloved uh, disciple gets entry into Pilate's court. Peter is denied entry into Pilate's court, so he doesn't get to witness the trial firsthand. Uh, the denial then happens um, when Mary is given a new son to take care of her in the first century Jewish tradition. Uh, Peter is not the new son that she gets. Uh, the new son that Mary gets is the beloved disciple. He is not at the crucifixion. He is not the first to see Jesus risen. He is not the first to the empty grave. And he is not the first uh, post Jesus. He is not the one who receives the post resurrection appearance. That's Thomas. Yeah, Thomas gets that. Um, and so uh, Peter just loses over and over and over again to the other disciples moving forward. Um, if you are writing a, if you are writing a gospel, you would think that you would want to put your leader in like the best light for like as possible. And uh, for whatever reason, the Gospel of John. Now, the denial, obviously, right? Jesus, Peter's denial is in all four Gospels. That's a, uh, that's a tradition uh, in the early church for sure. Uh, but all these other things are not necessarily in the other Gospels. These are accounts that John chose to put in his gospel. And you have to ask the question, if all the other gospels didn't put them in, why did John decide to? One of the ways we answer that is, well, maybe the John community just really didn't like Peter for whatever reason. And we can get that. I mean, I don't know how many times like I drive through like whatever and I see signs that say like, don't blame me. I didn't vote for him. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that happens in our society, too, in our time. So uh, just because someone has been elected a leader doesn't mean that everybody goes like, all right, I'm, I'm behind that person. That person's the leader. So um, so it's it's not that hard to, to think about. Um, so um, so be aware of, of Peter's struggles as we move through the last um, <laughs> the last nine, uh, eight chapters of the Gospel of, of John. So we got a couple, just a minute or two. Any questions, comments? Yeah, Dick. I 
I, I have always read and, and learned that book watching was a societal practice, not just for Jews, mm. but for everyone in that time, because I mean, your feet got hot and sure he can cut up and everything. If you were wealthy enough to have servants, and if you invited somebody to come and eat with you, the somebody would expect that the servants would watch the feet. Wow. And so it's it's I think it's significant that John decides that when he goes to the home of Lazarus. She washes his feet, but with perfume, not yeah. just plain old water because yeah. he's Jesus, you know. But the, the foot washing didn't become thought of as uh, purification until the, the early church mm. started making up its dogmas. That's what that's what I was taught. And so the fact that Jesus would have washed their feet, the only thing they would have been thinking of was he's being a servant, the lowliest person in the household. Yeah. And we've been calling him Lord and Savior, and he uses that to explain why he did it, you know. Yeah. So it, it really was something you needed to get your feet washed. Sure. I mean, you needed it. So if, you, if you couldn't do it, you'd find a way to get down to the river before you went to bed. <laughs> because your feet are bad. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I appreciate you adding that. That's good. Thanks, everybody. Be well. Bye, y'all.